Hey guys, welcome to what we're going to call the history of FMW. This is going to be episode one. Uh, I have no idea how many episodes there will be, but with Onita retiring, I think there will be a definite final episode. And speaking of which, FMW uh, appears to begin and end with Onita. So uh, if you're going to tell the history of FMW, I think you kind of have to start with the history of Onita himself. So this first episode is pretty much all going to be Onita pre-FMW. Um, for anyone who doesn't know, Onita originally was an All Japan rookie. Uh, Onita joined the Federation in uh, 19, 1973, but before that, uh, I'm joined by, of course, Bahu FMW. You can find him at bahufmw.com, FMW World. I'm sorry, FMWWrestling.us. I'm sorry about that. And um, he's going to be our Onita historian for the day. Uh, Brett, what can you tell us about Onita before joining uh, AJPW? So he ended up, uh, as a young boy, he um, lived with his uh, parents and um, his father, they, they worked they um, worked in kind of selling cloth and everything in Japan. And then uh, his father died um, early on, like when he was like 13, 14 or so. And um, they needed money to support themselves. So he dropped out of high school and joined the All Japan Dojo, which had just been created. Um, the All Japan had just been created in 1972, and they opened the dojo in 1973. So he was actually the first student um, that enrolled into the dojo. And so pretty much he uh, started wrestling to make money for him and his mother. mother. Well, I, I, I didn't know any of that. That's so – that's cool, man. And um, do you know who were his influences uh, when he he got started? Uh, Terry Funk pretty much. I mean I would imagine also uh, Giant Baba just because that's who the whole – you know, he was such a superstar and everything. But I know um, Onita really looked up to Terry Funk even before um, – he had he before he even was a wrestler, and Terry Funk was super popular throughout Japan during that time as well. Of course, and the Onita Terry Funk relationship will carry on for a long, long time as we'll see going forward. Um, so uh, Onita began training in 1973, and he debuted the following year. Uh, what career highlights were there in that in those first few years? So pretty much he was just uh, a preliminary wrestler, um, just a green boy. He was Giant Baba's attendant. Um, he pretty much first three, four years just worked opening matches with uh, Masafuchi, um, who's still working in all Japan today. And he was actually the number two uh, person to graduate from the dojo. And they pretty much just worked uh, opening style matches for about three to four years um, throughout the seventies even. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, they always talk, uh, now at, at, at what point did Onita become the all Japan, uh, junior, um, star that most people kind of think of him as pre FMW? It wasn't actually until he came back from America. Well, his, uh, yeah, from North America, he came back and then they kind of started giving him a push and everything as the junior heavyweight. So around 1982, 1983, that's um, the time period. So he was, you know, eight, nine years into his career by the time he actually got a push in all Japan with any type of, you know, character or whatnot, which was, you know, top, the top junior heavyweight uh, in the division. And uh, not to jump around too much, but um, yeah, Onita went to the U.S. in 1981. What can you tell us about his his excursion during that time period? So he originally went to um, the Dominican Republic in Puerto Rico. That was his first day. Um, him and Masafuchi, um, they were kind of sent off and everything and started in Puerto Rico, went to the Dominican Republic. Well, um, in the Dominican Republic, what happened was – um, the the promoter wanted Onita to lose to their st top star in a two out of three falls match uh, two straight times. Onita refused to do this, and during the match, he actually stiffed the wrestler he was he was wrestling, who was the top star of the promotion. And um, so when he got back to the locker room, um, they pretty much the promoter pretty much had four wrestlers jump him, and they beat the hell out of Onita. And they end up they locked Masafuchi out the room so he couldn't help him, and they just uh, f just beat the hell out of him for a good 30, 40 minutes or so until they just got tired of beating him up. So Onita was badly beaten up. He uh, called Terry Funk 
And him and Masafuchi uh, went over to Amarillo, uh, and Onita stayed in Terry Funk's ranch um, during that time period. Um, and he recovered and uh, lived with Terry Funk for about a year or so. And uh, Terry Funk got him actually booked in um, San Antonio. And then he ended up, he, Terry Funk was actually the one that got him uh, over to Memphis. And that's when Onita, that's kind of what most people know uh, Onita in, during his U.S. stay was while in Memphis. And um, so that's when he, he uh, him and uh, Masafuchi, they kind of had a stereotypical Japanese gimmick. He was Mr. Onita, Mr. Fuchi. And um, pretty much the highlight most people know of Onita in Memphis was having the second concession, Tupelo concession brawl that had already been won before that was super famous. Um, and they had another one um, in 1981, and that was with uh, Ricky Morton and uh, Eddie Gilbert, where they pretty much just f- uh, had this wild brawl in, you know, in were in the concession stand of Tupelo and just were throwing everything, uh, you know, something that no one was seeing back then in 1981. And, you know, that's kind of what Memphis was known for, just this wild brawl, you know, weapons and everything like that. So that's what uh, Onita is mostly known for. And then he um, went to, uh, ended up through Giant Baba and all that. They um, He he ended up going to the Carolinas and he faced the likes of Ric Flair and Ricky Steamboat and all, cause all Japan had a kind of a deal with mid Atlantic, uh, NWA, uh, promotions back then. Awesome. And, uh, what, what other, uh, even if he didn't participate in them, what other type of gimmick matches did he see during this time period? Yeah, during the uh, he so like I mentioned, he saw the wild, crazy brawling in Memphis. He also saw the barbed wire in uh, Puerto Rico, and he saw the blood and everything like that. And um, he ended up uh, integrating that in his style of wrestling. You know, a decade later, but he ended up learning the um, kind of, like I said, the 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 barbed wire style in Puerto Rico, and while in Memphis, kind of that hard hitting, wild brawling all over the place uh, style. So he kind of integrated both of those um, into FMW. Uh, in the 90s. Now, um, just kind of curious, um, at this time period, 1981, 82, what is the what is the feeling about blood and weapons in the Japanese wrestling culture? So, um, in around the early 80s or so, New Japan was number one. It was the top promotion. Um, they had just created Tiger Mask, um, who was this, uh, who was the number, was a big time draw, big time uh, um, cr- crowds loved him, uh, the style, everything was just brand new. So all Japan countered with, with blood actually by um, during a match with Abdul the Butcher, um, he ended up using his fork on Terry Funk, and Terry Funk bled like crazy, which nobody had really seen in Japan at the time. So that was brand new. Um, so All Japan kind of brought this new style, you know, just bleeding and, you know, kind of the shock and awe of, you know, of um, – of kind of of losing my train of thought, sorry, kind of the shock and awe of using the blood and uh, and everything in the matches. Yeah. Um, I've seen, I've seen a lot of those matches and it's weird to think of what, you know, for me, AJPW got famous with Kawada, Misawa, Tawe, and then you, you go back 15 years and it's a lot of forks and blood and, and brawling. It's a, it's very different for sure. Um, and, um, uh, just a final side note about this. Do you know what was the television standards back then? Because I know that, that there was matches where Freddie Blassie came over and he would be biting people and, and, and there'd be blood and, uh, people in the audience would be screaming. The television crews didn't know if they should be filming it. Was there any apprehension from the television stations? Um, I don't believe so. I, I don't. I mean, that that was kind of the main thing that they were highlighting with the promotion and whatnot. Now they didn't do it all the time. It wasn't a you know everyday thing like FMW developed or you know other promotions like the Deathmatch promotions do today. So it wasn't an everyday thing, but it was kind of what got them popular. It kind of kept them afloat because they were struggling up against New Japan and whatnot. But they're, um, I mean, those kind of the matches they usually only showed the main events on TV and everything, and those were the main events. So. They, um, at the time, it was okay. Great. Um, and uh, so uh, in 1982, uh, Onita returns to all Japan. Uh, uh, what what type of push is he now going to get after coming back? 
So he kind of was put into the um, into the middle right there. Like I said, he was the uh, the junior heavyweight, the top uh, of the division, and so he was kind of going to be known as the worker. Like, and he was the counter to New Japan's Tiger Mask, and so he was having uh, pretty good matches for the time and everything, um, just to you know kind of stand out as for his work weight work rate for his um, high flying style, which again it was nothing compared to Tiger Mask, but it was kind of all Japan's. Uh, counter to it um and so pretty much a good mid-card position he had his feuds he you know but he wasn't the main event ever or anything like that okay and um i no, i'll be honest I, i've never actually seen these uh uh the these matches but they're they're pretty famous what innovative parts of the matches would you think uh came about at that time period like was onita a high flyer or was he kind of a ground-based junior no, he was a high flyer. He was doing planchas and topes, um, you know, things like that, which, you know, they were they, they had been done, you know, and everything like Mil Mascaris and whatnot would have been doing them, you know, in the 70s. But it, he was bringing them to, you know, a different set of audience and everything and kind of, um, you know, like I said, it was kind of a counter to New Japan's Tiger Mask, but it wasn't at the level of what uh, Tiger Mask was doing. Okay, cool. And uh, uh, next, um, the next big stop on the train would be the Chavo Guerrero feud, which is what I probably know most about Onita because there's the most video footage of it online that's easy to access. Um, do you want to go over the uh, uh, the Chavo feud and the famous tournament final? So uh, pretty much, Chavo Guerrero was working for. Um for mid Atlantic. And like I said, um, they were kind of had, they had all Japan and mid Atlantic had brokered a deal and, you know, Onita and giant Baba, they had gone to the Carolinas. Um, and in return, um, the Guerreros, Hector and, um, Chavo senior, uh, would come by, uh, to Japan and tour with all Japan. And so Onita, um, had a match where he defeated, uh, Chavo Guerrero senior. And, um, he was awarded the trophy of, uh, um, you know, at the at the time and still today, you know, after winning a championship, you're awarded a trophy. Um, so he was given the trophy and uh, Chavo Guerrero, um, you know, shook his hand and then back suplexed him and then began sma uh, took the trophy and then began smashing it up against Onita's leg, which uh, caused you know a lot of blood and just blood everywhere and every and everything like that, which was kind of like the very first Onita blade job, pretty much. And was this uh, was this a shock? Like at this time, was this angle still shocking, or was it kind of par for the 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 course? It was still shocking. Um, I mean, it was still something that they didn't expect. You know, blood, like I mentioned, you know, the Terry Funk, Abdul the Butcher thing had happened, so blood existed. But still, at the time, seeing, you know, even just a mid-card guy and, you know, and the way, the style it happened, you know, he's, his leg was cut up. You know, it wasn't just the forehead or it wasn't just the fork to the arm. You know, his leg was bleeding, you know, profusely. So it was just, it was something different, even though it wasn't the first, you know, time that the audience had seen blood or anything like that. Yeah, for those who haven't seen it, it's a prolonged beatdown. I mean, it goes on for quite a while. There's bells ringing, people are running in. The there's blood all over. He breaks the you know Chavo breaks the trophy. It's um even nowadays, if they were to do this on television now, it would be a pretty eye catching angle for sure. It's uh very cool. Um now uh for anyone who doesn't know, I'm going. Uh, on Bahu's site, he has a history of FMW kind of, so I'm kind of using that as my guide. Uh, the next stop would be his knee injury. Is there anything that you want to go over between the Chavo feud and this knee injury that happens? Well, it, a lot of people confuse the two because a lot of people see the gruesome injury and just kind of relate to, oh, that's what uh, he messed up his knee. Well, it was actually about a year later. Um, Onita was coming out of the ring, um, kind of like how the rockers in WWF used to do where like they kind of have what one hand up against the apron and kind of pull themselves out of the ring. Well, he did that. And that was his signature, uh, you know, exit to the ring, exit of the ring back then. And he did that and ended up slipping on some water on the mat. Someone had spilt water on the, um, the little blue mat around ringside. And he, fe he, he fell and busted his knee up really bad, tore some he uh, just he was so upset because um, he was supposed to get a big push. He was supposed to um, get a push into the main event uh, as a main event types uh, person with all Japan at this point. 
um, because he had about, you know, he had the talent, he had good matches and everything. And, you know, he'd been in this, uh, the promotion for about 10 years or so. And Giant Baba was finally going to give him that push. And right around that time, he, you know, his knee was so bad. Um, it took him about a year to recover, um, for him to actually try a match. And then he, um, he had a match. It, he was not a good worker anymore. He just, it just, he was slow. It, it, he, he just had not fully recovered. And Giant Baba let him go pretty much and just said, you, you know, you, you, I can't have you wrestle anymore. And so pretty much Onita was forced to retire at this time and um, walk away from wrestling. Because at the time, there was only New Japan and All Japan, and he wasn't going to go to New Japan. So it was just it, leave, the, leave the business at that time. Wow, I, I didn't know any of that. There were, you know, back in the early days of the internet, there was a, a clip of him coming off the top rope, and everyone said that that was where his knee injury happened. But it's, it's usually the small stuff that causes the injuries. Um, so what what year would it have been when he officially retired the first time? Uh, January of 1985. So, he, like I said, he had a match in – he came back in December 1984, and it just wasn't working out. And, I mean, so they only gave him about a month to try and recover from the injury, and, and what they saw they didn't like, and they pretty much – Baba let him go. So um, January 1985, he was out of the business. You might not know the answer to this, but did Onita bow out gracefully, or did he kind of fight it? Um, I think it was just kind of one of those uh, you can't do anything about it because he had, you know, just the way the Japanese are where, you know, Giant Baba had just so much respect to even to, you know, even to this day, Onita talks, you know, with such respect to, about Giant Baba. So it's just one of those he makes the rules, he makes the decisions. I got to go with it. All right, cool. And um, so in this time period, there's a pretty famous story that uh, post, uh, post-retirement, uh, Onita spent some time in jail. It is... Is this true or is this just rumor? It is true. I, I do know that. Now, the reasoning why um, I'm not 100% clear on, I have heard in the past it was over taxes. Um, I know that Onita was very into um, trying to get um, trying to get as much money as possible. Tr- kind of like um, it didn't try. He'd scam people and stuff like that. He's, he had a lot of get rich schemes. Um, he actually tried, and when he was living with Terry Funk, he was trying to get a, uh, he was trying to uh, sell um, uh, wireless tel- telephones and everything, which, you know, obviously would turn into cell phones, you know, and everything. But he was trying to promote that and everything in the 80s. So it, he had a lot of like, hey, you know, put some money in here, you know, get, you know, get rich, uh, quick kind of things, uh, kind of schemes and whatnot. Um, so I do know that that was, um, you know, the, he, but, um, he also had a lot of financial issues after he retired. And like I said, the rumor I had heard was, um, w- was over taxes, but I'm not 100% sure about that. Uh, this doesn't sound, uh, I don't know. Have you seen the prices for the Onita retirement show? Uh, I think two hundred dollars for front row seats, and then like a hundred, and then like sixty and fifty. Yeah, I'm. You know, not too much has changed. I, I I was actually planning on possibly going to that, but I think they kind of priced me out with the ticket prices. Sad but true. Um. So okay. Uh. Well, and he, and real quick, yeah. he actually he tr- he wanted the show to happen at Kawasaki Stadium. Um, it right now is a football stadium, and he tried and tried so badly to have an exploding match um, for his retirement. But uh, Kawasaki Stadium is now, like I said, a football stadium, and it was and the retirement is going to be in October. So he could not get a scheduled uh, event for the show. Mm, so he had wow. to go to Corrigan Hall and a much smaller building. So he just he wants to make as much money off of his retirement as possible. So he priced the heck out of uh, those tickets. Yeah, uh, I wish him luck in selling him out. I really wish I could be there, but the numbers don't add up for me. So but <laughs> I I wish him luck. Do you um just curious? Do you think he would like sell out a, a stadium at this point? Um, I think. Well, Kawasaki's a lot smaller. Is the is the thing? It's not the fifty thousand seat stadium that it used to be. Um, it's a it's a different stadium. They pretty much tore it down and rebuilt it. And I, I actually went there in two thousand eleven. It's pretty much it's a little bit bigger than a high school football stadium. Mm. So it probably fits about twelve thousand people. Um, so I mean, I think with the proper uh, stipulation, the and I've actually heard rumors. You know, he he hasn't nothing's been officially announced. So the match. 
Um, and I don't think it would have happened at Kawasaki Stadium, but the rumor is that he'll be taking on Terry Funk if Terry Funk can go at 75. But um, oh he, I, I think that, yeah, I think that <laughs> um, if it was Kawasaki Stadium and the explosions and all that, I mean, I think he could get eight to 10,000 people. This changes everything. I, I might have to go to this now. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, okay. Uh, so during this time period, he retired in 1985, and he didn't actually show back up for a couple of years. What did, besides the famous scandal with him going to jail, what else did he do during this time of note? He started doing construction, and he, he actually made decent money around, uh, during that time period. Um, so right after wrestling, he actually wasn't struggling financially, but he ended up falling while doing construction. And with his bad knee, he couldn't do it anymore. And then that's when he kind of uh, was just jobless, and all the money issues took place and everything, and then the jail incident and everything. Um, after he got out of jail, then um, he ended up training uh, – for JWP, which is an old women's promotion. And he was a trainer there around 87, 88. And then kind of being around the wrestlers and all that, just, he kind of got that feeling. I want to come back. Cool. And so, uh, now according to your site, I'm going off of, off of your site's history. He first appears at the pioneer sensei wrestling promotion. Uh, what is this? I've never actually heard of this. So Ryum, Ryuma Go, who was an old All Japan wrestler um, during the time period of Onita, he had started up the very first, pre well, pretty much, yeah, the first uh, independent promotion, or a small independent uh, wrestling promotion in Japan. There was IWE, which was an old promotion in the uh, 70s, but that was a much bigger promotion. It was kind of like the number three. This was, uh, Pioneer Sensei was a much, much smaller number three. Um, and, I mean, pretty much just kind of like, you know, a small little independent compared to WWF, WCW. It, you know, it, there was no actual competition. It was just another promotion that was just created. And it was just, um, you know, it was Ryuma Go's, um, you know, way of, I, I can't work in all Japan anymore. I got let go from, you know, and new Japan, you know, I'm never, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to make it in new, new Japan. I'm going to start my own independent promotion. So it was kind of like that, where it was a way to get him to keep him working and whatnot. So he had created his own, which, you know, at the time, like I said, you know, with Onita and other wrestlers, you know, once once they got let go from their other promotion, um, you know, unless they were a main star like Stan Hansen or someone like that, they weren't going to flip flop promotions. They were just going to have to leave the business pretty much. And what was the state of independent wrestling in Japan at this time. I mean, was there television to be on? Was the, were they selling tapes? Like, what type of sh of crowds did they draw? Um, not too much actually. Yeah, no, no TV, nothing like that. Um, I think they hired um, people in the crowd to videotape because um, there are some handheld videos of Pioneer Sensei around this time period. Um, so there is, um, uh, you know, so there would be some kind of circulation, kind of like, you know, tape traders in the nineties and whatnot, except not really, you know, not from television. Um, but so, it, but not very, uh, Pioneer Sensei did, was not a successful promotion by any means. Like I said, it was a very small promotion that Ryuma Go at the time just wanted to keep working. So mm -hmm. nothing, nothing over a thousand or anything like that. Fine. Uh, Final question, what type of style did they employ? Was it a pre-UWFI uh, kind of shoot style? No, it was just pretty much just a standard basic. I mean, there really was no style to the promotion. It was just just matches, um, okay. you know, just regular matches that you would see. Nothing, nothing great, nothing you need to go out in your way to see or anything like that. It literally was just a way for people to wrestle and people to make money as an alternative to new Japan, all Japan, but it never really caught on because it only ended up lasting about a year or so. Oh, okay. I got you. Okay. And, uh, the, what was the reaction for Onita coming back? Was it, did nobody really care? Was it kind of a, a ballyhooed thing? Yeah. No, um, it wasn't, um, looked down upon because I think at the time, you know, it wasn't like he had promoted – it wasn't like there was this big, you know, retirement tour or anything like that like he later had with FMW. It was just kind of one of those, you know, hey, I had to leave and now I'm back. And, you know, and you know, um, like Terry Funk and whatnot had, you know, already came back from retirements and much bigger promoted um, type – 
you know, gimmicks and ways to make money. You know, when Onita retired, it was literally just to leave the business. It wasn't to let me have this retirement match and make all this money or whatnot. It was just so the fans didn't feel duped or anything like that. And it was just Onita, you know, wanted to, you know, he was struggling financially. He and he still had that itch uh, for the pro, for the uh, pro wrestling business. Great. And this would have been in what time period? 1988? Yeah, 1988 is when he uh, came back. Okay, great. Um, now, the following year, I'm guessing after this Pioneer Sensei kind of folded, uh, Onita would show up at the at some UWF uh, shows to, uh, as now we would call it, shoot his own, own angle, kind of. Uh, can you go over that? Yeah, so UWF was really popular at the time um, in the late 80s. It was a, it was a shoot style promotion that no one had really seen. You know, it was kind of the counter to uh, New Japan, All Japan and their worked matches. You know, this was a shoot style promotion and everything. And a- around this time, this is when Onita really kind of started to make his name because you know, no, it wasn't like in the eight, you know, in 87, 88, or when he did wrestle the Pioneer Sinche, uh match, it wasn't like people were clamoring for Onita. It wasn't like he had, you know, a following or anything like that. It was just kind of like, oh, that's that junior heavyweight from five years ago. So, but when he um, shot his own angle, pretty much he challenged UWF. He wanted to have a match with UWF. And he went to um, the building to shoot his own angle. In uh, he went and he went to the the building and everything. And they told him, "You can't come in. You don't have a ticket. Go away." And so that kind of caught some uh, media attention and whatnot. That UWF was not answering Onita's challenge. Like, and you know, it was kind of the you know UWF is scared of Onita type um, angle that was going on. And you know, it kind of caught on. And that's actually the first time that Onita began drawing some attention because the media was picking up on it. And he would continue to do this. I mean, uh, you tell me he, you know, when he wasn't wrestling, he was kind of trying to get into get rich quick schemes. It's very similar here, and uh, I think it makes him sound awesome. He really is the wild thing. Um, where did this UWF feud lead? So it ended up not really result. It resulted in the beginning of FMW, but had nothing really to do with UWF because after that, nothing really. Um, folded until about 25 years later, um, until like last year, um, but that's a whole different story. But um, essentially what happened was Onita contacted uh, the World Karate Association, which was a karate promotion in Japan, and he um, wanted, he uh, a match was scheduled with uh, Masashi Oyagi, uh, who's one? Who's the top karate expert in the promotion and whatnot? And uh, Onita challenged him to a karate match to kind of show that, hey, look, I U- UWF, I can wrestle shoot style. Look at me, I can take on one of the top, you know, um, you know, legit uh, fighters in the country. And so they had a, um, you know, a karate style match that Onita ended up getting disqualified in for using pro wrestling moves. He kind of just, you know, he was losing and everything, and then he just ended up, you, you know, he started using a back suplexes and whatnot and, and got DQ'd. And so um, after that, then, um, you know, the, the feud with Oyagi continued, but Onita, you know, said, I want to have a mixture of pro wrestling and martial arts, and I want Oyagi to come, you know, and fight me in that kind of style. So that's when he um, got with um, some uh, Weekly Gong um, publishers, uh, Wally Yamaguchi, who ended up being in WWE for a brief second in 1998, um, as well as Miki Arabi, uh, uh, Ibaragi, um, you know, he got with them, and they pretty much created Frontier Martial Arts Wrestling, and that's why where the the martial arts comes in from was that it originally was a mixture of wrestling and martial arts, so that he could challenge Yagi to kind of that mixed style of match. There's actually a uh, there's a video game from I think 1992. It's an FMW video game, and it's more like a Street Fighter style karate fighter, and I'm sure it. It, it 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 takes back from those first um, influences, but it was weird as a kid picking up an FMW uh, game and there's no explosion barbed wire matches. It was just a bit strange for me. Um, real quick, these matches with uh, Aoyagi, were they works? Were they shoots? Like, how did these matches work? 
They were worked matches. There was everything was planned. Um, you know, so pretty much um, the first match was in uh, Nagoya, uh, where Oyagi is from. So it was, and uh, the first match was pretty much Oyagi just beating the hell out of Onita and Onita fighting back. But at the end, um, him just taking so much punishment that um, someone, th- uh, I believe Tarzan Goto, threw in the towel. And uh, Oyagi won the match. Um, you know, so it was all planned and everything. And then they came back four days later at Cork and Hall and had another match. And Onita, you know, again, took a beating and everything. He's taking all these hard kicks and whatnot. And so it was a hard style of match, but they were worked finishes and everything. And Onita ended up winning with a Thunderfire powerbomb to finally defeat Oyagi. Awesome. And uh, so at this point, what, what, do you know the date of this final match? This the final match was at Corrigan Hall. Uh, it was October tenth, nineteen eighty nine. Okay, and uh, uh, w- w- was that under the World Karate Banner? No, they were both under FMW. So okay. the Nagoya show and the Corrigan Hall show were under FMW. They're the first two FMW shows, and they were so successful that they knew they had something after this. If the both shows had bombed, they would have just. Uh, folded right there but they both did really well um and so after that they decided we you know we gotta we gotta turn this into something else we gotta tour with this we there's more money to be made with this awesome well i think that's a good place to stop as far as the timeline goes uh when when we come back we'll we'll start doing the year by year analysis of the fmw business and angles and stars but uh since, since we have some time left i was wondering uh uh, if we could go over some of the prehistory of some people who would go on to become mainstays with um, FMW as it went on. Uh, first, can you tell me who were the business partners that came that came together to create FMW? Like where did the funding come from and all of that stuff? So FMW started as a very, you know, poor promotion and everything. They were working off of, um, you know, just a couple hundred dollars and everything. So, uh, like I said, he got with uh, Mickey Ira- uh, Ibaragi and he got with Wally Yamaguchi um, and just kind of they all ended up funding it through sponsors and everything like that. And I think the World Karate um, Association, you know, put some money into it as well and everything. So it was very, you know, kind of a... Um, you know, kind of everyone came together to get those two shows, um, you know, through. And once those two shows were successful, then they kind of had money to play and whatnot. All right, cool. Um, a few more names just to go over. Uh, one name that I, I was always a big fan of would be Tarzan uh, Godo, who would not only be a big part of the early F- FMW deathmatch boom, but he would go on to be part of IWA and such. Uh, what was Tarzan Goto like before, you know, in this pre FMW 1980 uh, period? So um, Goto had kind of a similar beginning uh, as Onita. He started off in all Japan a little after Onita, like 81, 82 ish or so, and kind of went through the system and everything like that. Um, and then he was sent off to America around 85, 86 or so um, to tour and whatnot. He went to Memphis and he uh, went to Florida. Um, you know, so he lived in America for several years. And by the time he was um, pretty much dur- somewhere during that time period where he was in America, all Japan was no longer interested in him and let him go. And so he pretty much just had to continue working in America and whatnot and just making ends meet and whatnot. And so in 89, when Onita started FMW, he contacted Goto, kind of feeling like he has, you know, he's a big guy. He can be a good number two. He'll work cheap, um, you know, and I, he had a relationship with him. Cool. And uh, you, you obviously can't talk about Onita without talking about the recently passed Mr. Pogo. Mr. Pogo would go on to be probably Onita's greatest rival. Uh, he went on to be part of the big deathmatch boom of the 90s with Wing, IWA, BJW, and a few other smaller promotions. Uh, what was Mr. Pogo's history? So he pretty much started off as a sumo wrestler, um, and then he, um, you know, he was he was such a um, a popular sumo wrestler, and he got uh, he, he was pretty much recruited to the New Japan Dojo. And um, Mr. Pogo is one of the very first New Japan um, Dojo graduates in '72. And so he uh, worked, but he was not a good worker at all, though. Um, he only had a couple matches in New Japan in 72. And then he was sent off to the North. He was sent off to North America. 
and he went everywhere. He went to uh, started in Calgary, went to California, went to Texas, went to Kansas City, um, went to Florida, went to the Carolinas, uh, came back to Calgary, worked Vancouver. So, so he worked all over North America before uh, working in port, finally finding a spot in Puerto Rico for the um, the last bit of the '80s and whatnot. Um, and he pretty much lived in Puerto Rico the last three years and and everything. When Onita reached out to him, uh, you know, to be the number one heel, he actually was flying to from and to uh, Puerto Rico because he was making such. Uh, he had developed, you know, he had a family there and whatnot. So, um, you know, had a permanent job in Puerto Rico. Um, but when Onita came calling and, you know, he kept getting brought back and whatnot, then uh, Mr. Pogo pretty much became a full-time FNW wrestler. Cool. And uh, the last uh, the last deathmatch pioneer on, on on this list would be Mitsuhiro Matsunaga, who would, Mr., you know, he would want to be Mr. Danger, and he would participate in most of the, the big Japan freak show deathmatches that I think most people have seen at least clips of. Uh, and he's all over the first couple dozen FMW shows Uh what was he like before becoming the Mr. Danger? So he was a student to Oyagi um, with the World Karate Association. So Matsunaga had actually started off uh, learning karate. And so when he started working with FNW in 89, um, those matches were through Oyagi, the FNW World's Karate Association relationship that they had at the time. Um, and so, and him and actually Jerry Flynn um, from WCW, you know, they had a match with Onita and Goto um, and everything like that with the, um, in FMW. And then after that, um, the World Karate Association kind of pulled away from FMW and um, pretty much Matsunaga just worked, uh, you know, just was a karate fighter and whatnot up until uh, Wing uh, started up in 91. So, uh, and then he ended up becoming the face of the promotion there. Um, and that's where, you know, um, they, they had a kind of a different style of than FMW. They had more, you know, uh, fire and whatnot. And, um, you know, but he ended up becoming really popular and the number one face for uh, Wink. Have you ever been to his, uh, 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 the Mr. Danger Steakhouse? Yeah, I went one time in 2010. Cool. Uh, I don't eat meat, so I haven't been, but it's like I need to go. I need to just suck it up and have some French fries and just go. Yeah, he's usually there. Like when I went there, because I always wonder, because there's actually two of them now because it's such a popular um, establishment. But, I mean, when I went there, he was there, and every time I see people go there, he's always there. So, And he was he was there even when he was still wrestling and whatnot. So it's been around for 20 years or so. Yeah. Uh, going beyond the whole deathmatch brawling, there were uh, uh, one guy that uh, was a big part of the FM, FMW scene was definitely uh, 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 Ricky Fuji. Ricky Fuji was, until Hayabusa, he was probably the, um, uh, the light heavyweight star. Uh, where did Ricky Fuji come from? So Ricky Fuji started in the New Japan Dojo in the late 80s. Um, he came along up with uh, Shinya Hashimoto. Um, and he wanted, he, around this time period, the late eighties decided he didn't want to be a pro wrestler, pro wrestler anymore. He wanted to, uh, be a UWF, uh, fighter. And so he, um, decided I'm, he just left the, the new Japan dojo one day, he just decided he was done with wrestling. He flew to Florida, uh, because he heard that Frank Gotch had, who was kind of known as the top, you know, shoot fighter and he could be, you know, train him and everything. He went to Tampa uh, to go be trained by Frank Gotch. Problem was, he goes to Florida, and nobody knows who Frank Gotch is. He kind of misunderestimated the popularity of Frank Gotch, you know, in the late 80s. So he goes to a taxi uh, cab at the airport and goes, take me to Frank Gotch's. Taxi driver has no idea what he's talking about. So the taxi drivers end up getting together trying to help him, and it turns out that one of them is Pat Tanaka's uh, father working as a taxi driver. And so he gets Pat Tanaka in contact with Ricky Fuji. Ricky Fuji stays with Pat Tanaka in Florida, and he's right next door to Florida Championship Wrestling, Dusty Rhodes and all that. He sees all, you know, he sees all this wrestling going on. He goes, you know what? I want to be like, I want to do that again. 
uh, you know, that's so awesome, you know, all this, you know, seeing this different style of wrestling. So then he ends up flying to Calgary um, to work with the Hart brothers. He, um, you know, there's such a good reputation with the Hart brothers school at the time. He flies up to Canada. He trains there. Um, he has his first match with Ross Hart in 88. Um, and then he ends up um, getting a better deal with the rival um Vancouver promotion and begins working as kind of like a tiger mask ripoff and everything like that. Um, about 89 until FNW, um, contacts him and he ends up accepting the offer to go back to Japan, um, and begin working with FMW as the junior heavyweight. Cool. And, uh, just as FMW wanted and, uh, just as FMW wanted to solidify a light heavyweight, uh, 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 division uh during the 90s women's wrestling in japan was huge and they even had uh kind of a thriving women's uh women's division and it was led by megumi kudo uh where did she come from so she started up in uh, all japan women's promotion she um you know like many girls at the time with the crush girls being so popular wanted to be a wrestler so she started uh wrestling at 16 you know she uh, she went to the dojo at 16 or so um and uh worked the you know lived the dojo life and everything um and she you know made her debut in 1986 and she wrestled but you know at that time the skill level was so high and you know so many famous wrestlers that she trained with you know came from that um even her graduating class of 86 you know Aja, Aja Kong was there um Bull McConnell was already there so there was already all these great elite workers that she didn't stand out and so they let her go after about a year or so and um, she ended up taking a job as a um, as a kindergarten aide, um, you know, helping the teacher out and everything like that with all the kids and everything. And so she did that for about a year or so um, up until uh, 1990 when Onita wanted to start uh, when, with FNW. He wanted to start his own women's division. You know, it was something different. He didn't have enough uh, wrestlers to kind of fill, fill out a card, so this was going to be something different. Uh, in Japan, having a women's division in a men's promotion. So um, he already had um, had some uh, women's uh, wrestlers in the dojo, like uh, Shark Tashaya Tush and uh, Crusher Midori, Maya Domori. And um, he also had some foreigners and whatnot, like Jacqueline from WWF was uh, worked a tour and whatnot. Um, so, but he wanted some, you know, top, he wanted to bring, um, Three former All Japan Women's uh, Dojo wrestlers, which were Megumi Kudo, Combat Toyota, and uh, Raiban Amada. Those three, um, you know, had are, uh, all kind of had the same, um, you know, story as Kudo, um, where they were, you know, pretty much just after about a year or two, All Japan Women's let them go. And so he uh, brought them in to kind of have somewhat of a roster because, like, the other names I had mentioned, they were not good workers. Um, you know, they were green, and, I mean, they never ended up even really being good workers. So he wanted to actually uh, uh, pretty much have a legitimate division and have, you know, average to good matches at the very least. Sorry, my my – my mic was muted. Um, okay. <laughs> uh, and uh, going on, um, if you go uh, just to cover the foreigners real quickly as we kind of wrap up here, uh, if you go through the the first year of cards, one name that you see a lot that I don't really know anything about him is uh, Jos Le, Le, Le Duke. Yeah. How do you? Yeah. Who? Yeah. Who, Joe. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. He he was a Montreal uh, wrestler. Um, you know, he pretty much just was a 1970s territorial wrestler. Um, you know. Wrestled in Montreal. He wrestled in AWA. He wrestled in uh, NWA. He wrestled in WWF in eighty um, around eighty seven or so, and just mid card matches and whatnot. Um, kind of a big, burly, you know, um, kind of think of Ox Baker type style, you know, bearded, bald man and whatnot. Um, you know, so just kind of a brawler, and, and but not necessarily like a good worker or anything. Mm -hmm. And the uh, the final wrestler to talk about would, would be uh, the gladiator Mike Awesome. He would go on to have a lot of success in uh, EC C ECW. He would be in the dying days of WCW. But um, and he, he even had a, a, a short run during the invasion angle in WWE WWF. Uh, what what launched him to the main stage where he became one of the first big foreign stars of the early days of um, 
FMW. So, like I mentioned, Tarzan Goto had worked uh, Memphis and Florida – uh, in the late 80s, and he actually worked with Mike Awesome. So, uh, but actually, the story is is that uh, Tarzan Goto, you know, was working Florida and everything, and they wanted to have a big giant, uh, you know, monster uh, Gaijin, uh, you know, work against Onita. So um, they actually first tried to contact Al Green, who ended up uh, working for WCW and everything, and that didn't, you know, he, they were going to come up, they came up with the gladiator gimmick and everything like that for him. He ended up uh, pulling out at the last minute. So then Tarzan Goto reached out to Mike Awesome, who, like I said, he had worked against Tarzan Goto in Florida and everything. And so they brought him in to just be this monster guy, John, um, you know, work against Onita at the end of the tour. Onita beat him, and that probably beat it for him but he got so over he had a good you know work rate he got popular um you know they ended up bringing him back and then um just kept bringing him back for years and years and years and uh i would say his uh his matches with hayabusa are easily some of the top five top five highlight matches you know um i i was a big fan of mike awesome uh and uh he had a very tragic end like a lot of people in the business but uh, the final name I just want to talk about, he's kind of like the background godfather of um, of the company would be Sho Shoichi uh, Rai. Who was he, where did he come from, and what was his position inside the company? So pretty much he was just a big fan. Um, he... Um... You know, he um, had grown up being a, a big wrestling fan his whole life. And then he saw in uh, the magazines uh, FMW was hiring. Um, you know, before they had started, they were advertising for positions and whatnot. So Arai uh, went to an interview where he, um, Onita and all that were watching and, you know, he to be a ring announcer. So Arai, um, you know, started – Rye stood out. His voice was very, uh, he could uh, kind of have a high pitch and everything like that. Um, you know, put a lot of passion into his voice and Onita hired him uh, to be a ring announcer. And so he started off as a ring announcer. And as the years went by, he pretty much work, started working with the office. He ended up becoming a uh, vice president while Onita was in charge of FMW. And then when Onita um, ended up selling FMW, he sold it to Arai, who uh, was the owner to, F, uh, to FMW until the very end. Mm -hmm. Great, and uh, if anybody wants to read it uh, on on uh, on Bahu's site, he has an excerpt from Arise uh, autobiography where he talks about uh, finally folding the company in 2002, and it's it's a great read if you want to learn how the business works uh, in that country. And um, you know, being in Japan, I was reading it well there, and like I'm in the places where he's talking about, and it was very surreal. And he talks about how selling the Selling the ring is the final stage before a company ends, and it's it's a it's a it's a great read, and I would implore anybody to to go ahead and read that. Um, is there any other name that you want to uh, to go over? Um, not not off the top of my head as far as the first year or whatnot. Um, you know, I had mentioned um, the previous one, Goito. Um, just, uh, he, you know, he started off as a referee and he ended up becoming one of the bookers. And like I mentioned in the last, uh, episode, um, he was, uh, one of the most influential bookers in wrestling. You know, he was great at kind of dealing with the politics of, you know, wrestlers wanting to go over and everything like that, as well as coming up with creative storylines. Um, and you know, he's pretty, uh, noticeable, um, you know, for all, during all the exploding ring matches, he's always the one wearing the big giant uh, outfit, um, looking the like he you know, has a fallout suit. Outfit. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> It's uh, it's uh, I I think that that visual is what immediately hooks people is seeing this rep in this blast suit. You know, it makes you think what's about to happen. Uh, so uh, well, awesome. Um, I just want to say this was great for me because this is a lot of stuff I didn't know, and the whole reason why I wanted to reach out to Bahu and do the and and do this series was about uh two months ago or so. Dave Meltzer had had a question on his show where someone asked. If Onita never uh, injured his knee, what would the business be like? And Dave went through the butterfly effect of, well, there would have been no FMW, there would have been no ECW, there would have been no Attitude Era, and the and there probably would have been no deathmatch boom. I mean, it's one of the greatest butterfly effects to even try to think about. 
Um, mm -hmm. So this was super fun. Um, if you're not busy, I was wondering if you could take a few minutes and go over some of the the uh, uh, the more recent news with uh, Onita, the Deathmatch companies. I know there's a lot of new news about the Super FMW uh, or the Super Battle FMW uh, League. Um, if you wanted to just go over some of the bigger news that's gone on in the past few weeks. Okay, so he had a match uh, at the Shikimbi, Shinkiba first ring. Um, he teamed up with um, Tamahiko Hashimoto, uh, Raiden, and Tam Nakano, who is a um, who is a model um, that has become a wrestler here recently, and she has adapted the uh, she adopted the same similar gimmick of uh, the Great Tam. And with Nita, with Onita saying that's his sister, in storyline, um, and they took Wait, on. Um, um, is she is she the girl that wears the barbed wire bra? Uh, no, that's someone. That's someone else. That's okay. someone different. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. No, um, but yeah. So they wrestled the match um, at Shikiba First Ring, and afterwards, um, you know, Onita ended up uh, pinning Onryo in the um, in the main event, and afterwards, uh, he pretty much walked out of Shinkiba. And there's a, a, a river right there uh, within walking distance. And so he walked out there with all the fans, you know, coming with him. And he walked into the river, uh, photographers and everything like that, taking pictures as if, as if he's returning to the sea uh, where he came from originally. So um, that was uh, last week. Um, he uh, is going to be – next month he's going to uh, be teaming up with uh, Shiku Shikuza uh, Nagoyo. Uh, who was, you know, a famous crush gal uh, wrestler in all Japan women's wrestling in the mid '80s. Uh, he's formed a partnership with her the last uh, couple years or so, and they're going to be teaming up for the last time. Um, and then later in the month, uh, Onita is going to be taking on uh, Masato Tanaka uh, for the Super Fireworks uh, Heavyweight Title in an exploding barbed wire match um, in Nagoya. Great. Um... Yeah, the whole Great Nia thing. I wish I could have been there, but I was at a Freedom show. That it, it's like Freedoms and and oh and Onita run at the same time constantly, and I I've never yeah. gotten to see Onita because I buy my Freedoms tickets once I <laughs> I plan the trip and I find out about Onita much later. It's always a a bummer. Um, just a a couple last bits of of indie deathmatch news from me. June. Kasai has welcomed his kid. He had a, a daughter uh, a couple days ago, so we wish him luck. And uh, also at the Tokyo Deathmatch Carnival, he sliced his hand open so bad that uh, they almost had to amputate a, uh, one of his fingers. And uh, he's going to be out for about two months, which is a bummer. But at least he gets to spend time with his family. So those are the big ones. And finally, uh, just as a note, because uh, me and Bahu had talked about Takeda and how he's uh, – you know, he's maybe a bit of a danger to himself. Uh, his doctor posted a thing on Facebook saying that he's having some spinal issues. But with him being the Big Japan uh, Deathmatch champion and participating in the Big Japan Tag League uh, all next month, I don't see him being able to take a break or anything. But I would say those are the big uh, the big news stories. Uh, Bahu, do you have anything else you want to add before we close? Uh, no, I think that's it. Fantastic. Um, where can people find you? Uh, BahuFNW.com, um, Twitter at uh, BahuFNW, and my Instagram is BahuFNWWorld, where I just post random pictures uh, every couple days or so. It's awesome. Um, if anybody wants to follow me, I'm actually doing a uh, uh, indie news co coalition WordPress. You can find it at per uh, per per per. I, I can never say this. Perori Pro in Yeah. Well. <laughs> Uh, it's going to be at per wordpress.com and I just, uh, twice a week, I just coalesce any news about Freedoms, Dove, BJW, uh, anything that, had, you know, Basara, anything that has to, to do with the, the death matches or indie wrestling, and I just kind of coalesce all of the news uh, that I find on Twitter and such, and... Uh, and that's about it. Thank you guys for listening, and we'll be back next week. Well, uh, I don't know when we'll be back, but it'll be soon. And we'll talk about the first uh, two or three years of FMW as it kicks off. So thank you so much, Brett. All right, thank you. Whoa!